In three, two, one. Seven things you don't really need to know, but probably should. I'm Jamie East, and this, this is the Sunday Sun. In today's episode, we hear about how the world's whitest paint could tackle climate change, the potential energy powerhouse of dairy farms, and how Singapore is using Legos to build back its coral. But first, it was this day in 1888 that the first US patent for a ballpoint pen was issued to John J. Lale. Since then, ballpoints have changed writing forever. The ancient Egyptians are well known for carrying out sophisticated mummifications of their dead, but a recent discovery of a mummified nobleman has the potential to rewrite the history books on what we previously thought about mummification. The preserved body of a high-ranking nobleman called Hui, discovered in 2019, has been found to be far older than assumed. It's been dated to the Old Kingdom, proving that mummification techniques some 4,000 years ago were already highly advanced. To find out more, we spoke to an Egyptologist close to the research. My name is Salima Ikram. I teach Egyptology at the American University in Cairo. And I work in, as a general Egyptologist, but one of my specialties is mummification, both human and animal. The mummy was found by fellow archaeologist Dr. Mohammed Megahed, and it was a huge find. I mean, this was a really exciting find because you don't find that many tombs nowadays from this era and certainly not ones that have their occupants and their pottery vessels and their canopic jars and this sarcophagi with them. So it was a deal. The sophistication of the body's mummification process and the materials used, including its exceptionally fine linen dressing and high quality resin, wasn't thought to have been achieved until at least a thousand years later. This mummy um, that we found somewhat disarticulated contained a lot of dark resin and very fine quality, extremely fine quality linen, gossamer thin, um, and loads of it. But the use of this kind of resin is not something that we are really familiar with from the Old Kingdom. It occurs almost, you know, 1500 years later um, in about 1000 BC kind of time period, 900, where you had this lavish or even up to 600 BC with this lavish use of resin. So it really made our head spin because we thought, oh, this mummy couldn't possibly belong to Hui because the mummy itself is really in the way it's made much, much later. If this is the mummy of Hui, then we really have to completely revise what we know about mummification and its history and the technology from the Old Kingdom. And also, it's quite interesting because the use of resin means that these resins come from the Near East and possibly even different parts of Africa. So the idea that extensive trade on a large scale was going being carried out at this time period also contributes to our understanding of Egyptian economy and trade relations. Um, so it does turn what we know about mummification and ancient Egypt on its head. But it's a uh, it's terribly exciting and also once you know right now not entirely sure if it's true. So we're taking carbon 14 samples and we really hope that these will work and that we might get an answer. If it is Hui, it'll be tremendous. Six. Scientists at Purdue University have created the world's whitest paint and it could be the next big thing in fighting climate change. The invention is seven years in the making and was developed by Purdue mechanical engineering professor Shulin Ruan and his team of graduate students. They wanted to create a paint that would reflect sunlight away from a building, dramatically decreasing the need for air conditioning. Speaking with This Is Purdue, the Purdue University podcast, Shulin explained. Conventional air conditioners, they just move the heat from inside of your house to the outside ambient. But the heat still stays in the city. It still stays on the earth. So that really contributes to the urban heat island effect in cities. Our paint compared to the commercial white paint can provide 10 kilowatt additional cooling power. 
if we use a typical air conditioner efficiency numbers, so that translates to save about 10 kilowatt hour electricity per day for this house. If we use like 10 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, you know, price, that, that's about one hour per day of saving for the house. This new paint reflects 98.1% of sunlight due to a high concentration of barium sulfate, a chemical compound used to make the white in photo paper and cosmetics. By reflecting infrared heat, it allows buildings to cool below the surrounding air temperature. Our paints on the roof, it kind of sends off all the heat from the sun and from its own emission directly through the atmosphere and uh, lost to the deep space. So the heat totally you know, goes off the earth. The team's tests have shown that the paint can keep the surface around 8 degrees cooler than its ambient temperature in the afternoon and up to 19 degrees cooler at night. They calculated that if just one half to one percent of the Earth's surface were covered in this paint, it would reverse the total effects of global warming to date. They trialled the paint in the hot, dry climate of Arizona and Nevada and the results were... During the summer months, using the paints can save up to 70 percent of the air conditioning cost. In other words, in a certain days when it's not too hot, you do not need to turn on your air conditioners at all. The paints will just provide enough cooling for the temperature indoor to be more to be comfortable for human beings now uh, if the outside becomes very very hot you need to turn on your air conditioners still but the panes can offset a lot of heating and can reduce the demand for the air conditioner so overall it saves up to 70 percent of the power considering the typical weather over you know a few months in the summer now if you're desperate to get your hands on a can of this paint it's not on the shelves just yet but once production can be scaled the good news is the cost of this paint will actually be comparable to the regular stuff hopefully we will see this eventually on the market you know if we do everything quick in a year or two or so yeah i mean I, we do get a lot of uh, inquiries from people from the hot especially from the hot climate a large customer would be uh, India, you know, very hot. If you use too many air conditioners, the heat island effect is, is very serious there. So, yeah, pushing this into the market will really help a lot of people that really have the cooling needs. Still to come on the Sunday 7, the race to protect our devices from cosmic rays and Singapore saving coral reefs with Lego? In what engineers and doctors are calling a world first, a drone has been used in the Canadian city of Toronto to deliver lungs for a transplant operation. It flew one and a half kilometres in six minutes between two hospitals. Drones have already transported kidneys, corneas and a pancreas, and now donor lungs are joining the list. Here's the recipient of the lungs, Alan Hoddock, speaking to the BBC about the experience. That Friday, I was with my daughter, and then they came to tell me that it's possible that you'll get the you'll get the transplant later tonight or tomorrow morning. And then they asked me if I wanted to participate in this in this study. I said I wanted to do it because I'm, uh, I'm an engineer and I find it very interesting. And later that night, doctor said uh, the drone's going to be coming in soon. The lungs are on their way. And then he went and got up, went to a phone, and he came back and he said uh, your lungs have arrived. Uh, have arrived. Alan's surgeon, Dr. Shaf Kashavji, is a pioneer in his field and has been improving how donor lungs are preserved. Can we make the organ better than the way we found it? Can we actually improve it? What we have done is built a system where we actually transport donor lungs to the repair center, repair them on ex vivo uh, perfusion, and then transport them to the transplant center. We get a, an offer for a donor in the middle of the night and then multiple organs need to be placed to try and book planes to coordinate uh, all of these different transplants so you can imagine that being a lot simplified if you just have drones and, and program them to deliver the organ. As donor organs often need to be moved between hospitals, quick and reliable transport is vital. Martin Rothbat is founder and CEO of United Therapeutics, the company that developed the drone and box to safely transport organs. The organ is put in a liquid solution, which serves as sort of a shock absorber. On top of that, we added a custom-made case made out of carbon fiber material, which has been designed to uh, minimize any vibration loads associated with the drone transport. 
And then finally, we have electronics that reports on the health of the organ along the way. We are developing drones that can fly up to very close to 400 kilometers. We hope that would allow organs to be flown across large distances anywhere in the world. As gas prices rise and the appetite for renewable energy sources also rises, a group of farmers have harnessed the largely untapped potential of the land. They're turning cow poo into cow power. The focus on renewable energy sources has historically centred on wind and solar, but in a bid to effectively use all resources available, there are farmers that want to tap into the power of poo too. With the government targeting 100% renewable energy by 2035, and we currently stand at 40%, We at Arla believe there is a huge potential in looking at alternative renewable sources such as cow poo as part of the UK's renewable energy mix. It's natural, readily available and can help reduce emissions at farm level at the same time. That was Graeme Wilkinson, Group Agriculture Director at Arla, the dairy company trialling what they've called cow patteries. As well as generating electricity, the process of harvesting power from poo also generates a byproduct that can be used as a natural fertiliser on farms. It works through anaerobic digestion, which is a process used to turn cow slurry into energy. During this process, organic matter such as animal waste is broken down to produce biogas and biofertiliser. Once the biogas is cleaned, it's taken into a combined heat and power unit where it's used to generate renewable energy. And the end product, digestate, is nutrient rich, reduced emissions and a natural fertiliser that can be put back on the land to help nourish the soil. So this means that we've got renewable energy and cleaner natural fertilisers for farming. So this really is a win-win. We have just under 2,300 Arla dairy farms here in the UK who have 460,000 cows on their farms. So through the process of anaerobic digestion, we could create enough power to fuel over 1.2 million UK homes. With benefits like these, it's clear to see why Graham sees this source of energy as a potential game changer in the country's overall ambition. But to make a real contribution, they need more support. The infrastructure needs investment, and while some of our farmers are already working with anaerobic digestion plants on their farms, to really scale this up and maximise its potential, we need the government and energy industry to work together to put the right infrastructure in place and increase the provision of AD facilities across the country. Still to come on the Sunday 7, drones are revolutionising organ donation and how poo power could be our way through the energy crisis. Right after this... You're listening to the Sunday 7. Follow us for your weekday news espresso, or even try our island edition. It's in all the usual places. By now, we all recognise the importance of coral reefs. They provide the ecosystem for life underwater, protect coastal areas by reducing the power of waves hitting the coast, and provide a crucial source of income for millions of people. Despite being a relatively tiny country, Singapore is home to a third of the world's coral reefs, and scientists from the National University there are trying to preserve them with Lego blocks. Singapore's coral reefs have been on the decline for decades due to issues like land reclamation and coastal development. This is thought to be the first ever use of Lego for reef restoration. Jani Tanzel is from the National University of Singapore and is part of the team with the innovative idea. You consider that the total number of uh, coral species around the world is about uh, 800. Uh, We're really very lucky to have almost a third of the world's uh, species diversity in such a concentrated in such a small area around the southern islands of uh, Singapore. The scientists start by taking loose bits from the coral reefs, which are then broken up into smaller pieces and attached to the Lego. The small pieces can then grow into larger colonies. This is pretty ingenious, but why Legos? It was modular, it was scalable, so if we wanted uh, to move We wanted to work with larger pieces of coral, we just need to stick on more Lego or more building blocks. You know, if we wanted to work with smaller corals, then we could use a smaller (laughs) uh, smaller, uh, Lego piece. 
So it's a bit like Singapore where we don't have enough space. We all have to live in high-rise apartment blocks. Vertical farming is not a, for corals, it's not a new concept as well. It's just that we've now taken the modularity of the building blocks uh, and the vertical farming concept and putting it together or stringing them down to maximise um, space in our uh, aquarium. For now, these coral pieces are used for research experiments at the St John's Island National Marine Lab, but the hope is to one day grow enough coral to be transported back into Singapore's waters. The race is on to stop a storm on the surface of the sun from bringing down the internet on Earth. Also known as solar flares, a sudden flash of increased brightness from the sun has the potential to bring down our digital systems. And this kind of scenario is becoming ever more likely as digital systems get smaller and more vulnerable to the effects of cosmic rays. To try and prevent these future problems, scientists here in the UK are using a chip irradiation instrument to test the resilience of electronic devices. The spikes in radiation caused by solar flares happen almost annually, with the last one happening on Thursday this week. This can cause bit flips in computers. This is when zeros or ones can be flipped for the other number. As the binary code forms the basis of all our digital devices, this could have devastating effects. Dr Christopher Frost is a scientist at the ISIS Neutron and Muon Research Facility in Harwell and is part of the team stress testing electronic devices. The concern really depends on the device. So one example is memory states. So memory is of course vital to electronics. If you think about your computer, it has lots and lots of gigabytes of memory in it. And memory states can be flipped by neutrons interacting with them. In other words, a neutron comes down, hits that memory, sits a bit of silicon in that memory state and turns a zero into a one or a one into a zero. Everything in our digital world is stored by ones and zeros, so we clearly don't want them changing. Using the radiation instrument, Frost and his team stimulate the atmosphere of neutrons to be one and a half billion times more intense, allowing them to speed up the testing process of devices. In other words, that we put electronic devices into the beam and effectively run them as if they're in the real environment for about 170,000 years. So 100, 170,000 years represented by one hour of testing on our beam line. And in that way, we can find all of the problems that are, that are going to happen in these devices as a result of these neutrons. And there's been a lot in the press over the years about solar flares and a lot of kind of doomsday scenarios. But our job is to make sure that you don't worry about it. Our job is actually for you almost not to notice our work because what we do is to put the solutions in place. So should there be solar flares, then we've, we've got the systems that are resilient enough to them. Facebook's been making the headlines for all the wrong reasons lately, and following an avalanche of negative press, the company's just announced a major rebrand. We're now looking at and reporting on our business as two different segments. One for our family of apps, and one for our work on future platforms. And as part of this, it is time for us to adopt a new company brand to encompass everything that we do. To reflect who we are and what we hope to build, I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now Meta. That is, of course, the unmistakable voice of CEO Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg made the announcement at Facebook's annual conference on Thursday, where he outlined his vision for the Metaverse, a digital world where people can game, work and communicate in a virtual environment using, well, virtual reality. Our mission remains the same. It's still about bringing people together. Our apps and their brands, they're not changing either. And we are still the company that designs technology around people. But now we have a new North Star to help bring the metaverse to life. And we have a new name that reflects the full breadth of what we do and the future that we want to help build. From now on, we're going to be metaverse first, not Facebook first. It's worth noting that the Facebook metaverse doesn't actually exist yet, but Zuckerberg certainly has the resource and ambition to stick it in our homes. This has been the Sunday 7. Wherever you're listening, do us a favour and hit the follow button. We'll be back tomorrow at 7am with the regular Smart 7. Have a great rest of your weekend. Written, produced and published by Daft Doris.